So Sharon, I think we should just, we should start and I'm sure people will join in, but I wanted to say welcome everybody. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Eileen. I'm uh, the director of the Center for Women's Leadership here at Cody Institute. And I'm so excited to be joined by Sharon today, Sharon Omotoso from uh, University of, uh, oh my gosh, I keep saying it wrong, Abidan and in Nigeria. And uh, this is a conversation today for graduates in, that are located in Nigeria. And uh, mm -hmm. I know uh, the, pop, the, the number of graduates, I don't have an exact count, but is actually growing uh, in leaps and bounds um, uh, every, it seems every year. And uh, I know for a fact that from the, uh, from the Women's Center in particular, uh, our women's leadership programs see hundreds and hundreds of applications coming from in, uh, from women in Nigeria every year. So there's, I think, something exciting that we can be exploring as we move forward about how we uh, we continue to partner and, and best support uh, Nigerian women on the rise um, in all mm -hmm. forms of leadership, whether that's at your at the community level, locally, in informal spaces, or that's informal political. Uh, forms of leadership. So, so welcome everybody. And Sharon, did you want to say a word about yourself as well? Okay, thank you, Eileen. My name is Sharon Omotosho. I am coordinator of the Women's Research and Documentation Center at the Institute of African Studies, University of Kibado. I am also a Cody graduate of the 2017 on the Women's Leadership Program. And I am indeed grateful that um, we have bringing the Nigerian team together. I am excited to see everyone and I hope that uh, we're going to have a wonderful conversation. Good morning. Good morning. And, you know, like every, like so many other, um, like all other countries globally right now, all of us are facing unprecedented times right now um, with the pandemic happening. And Cody um, has been reaching out to alumni um, around the world um, whether in specific sort of topic areas of interest or, or looking at a country level, um, at the ways in which um, we are responding as community leaders to the pandemic and how we and our organizations are finding also ways to support um, the communities um, that are most vulnerable and disadvantaged in the, in the crisis moment. So today's an opportunity for all of us to, to just have a, you know, an intimate conversation about what we're seeing has been the response in Nigeria to COVID-19, but also how, in particular, um, we are, you know, we are looking at what is what is fast becoming the new normal. What is the ways in which um, our organizations are adjusting? What is the and how do we intend to proceed even as we're coming out of the pandemic? So that's um, that's essentially this conversation today. Um, we, you know, why do we think we need this conversation? We think that there's an opportunity for us to be sharing, especially as graduates across our organizations and, and across our, our, our different communities, the different sort of experiences that have been happening. Um, I in particular, and, and Sharon also, I know, have, um, has a particular interest in looking at the gendered implications of COVID-19. So, you know, the differentiation uh, for men and women in terms of the ways that they're experiencing the challenges of COVID-19 and how do we ensure that that gets brought into the conversation for communities. But Nigeria itself is a, is a, is a, you know, a multifaceted complex country and experiences from one space to the next are, are very different, I'm, I'm imagining. So, um, you know, whether that's urban versus rural, whether that's north versus south, there's, there's different uh, also implications for different parts of the country. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to learn from all of you um, um, on what's been happening in your respective uh, areas. Um, so we will talk about the you know, community engagement as you're seeing on the, on the, on the uh, slide. And I encourage you to share with us um, some of your experiences around the sector that your, your work is taking place and what is happening, um, whether that be around food security or economic livelihoods or health and sanitation or the education sector or many others as well. Um, I also um, would hope that we can spend some time chatting a little bit about how we're focusing in on the most vulnerable or those that are 
historically underrepresented, especially in leadership spaces. Um, how are we ensuring that the work that we do is responding to you know, women and children, the aged, um, those with uh, different abilities, uh, those that might be economically marginalized, and so on. Um, and you know, in what ways can we be better thinking about how we influence public policy? How do we engage, how do we collectively engage also and influence public policymakers as they're thinking about what the new normal should be, as we're coming out of the pandemic and we're starting to see signs of opening up? What does that mean um, in terms of uh, the, the policies we put in place and what are the where, where do we think that we could have particular influence? Um, and at the end of the day, what is it that as Cody graduates, we can do to collectively mobilize as well? So I'm going to just turn to, um, oops, I'm going to turn now to Sharon for a moment to kind of set the stage for us in terms of the context that we're in and why this conversation is important for Nigeria. Over to you, Sharon. Okay, thank you very much. Eileen, I want to say a very big thank you to all the Cody grads that have taken time out to join us this morning. And first, I should start out by saying that this conversation is just very timely, and it is important for us to begin to put our energies together. I said earlier before the meeting started that I am excited because I will be meeting new faces. We are all in the same country, yet we've not been able to connect. What yeah. irony. But, but it's so good that um, this is bringing us together, Cody is bringing us together in our, from our own spaces, from our different spaces, to begin to see how we can put energy together. Why do we need this conversation? One, we all know, we all agree that Cody has exposed us to, all, to best practices in leadership and uh, in community engagement. And so we need a synergy of the efforts and the knowledge that we have gained while we were differently or individually as Koji um, to make positive, the positive impact that is needed in our country. This conversation is also a platform for comparative analysis uh, of situations across Nigeria. I just spoke with Joy. Joy is from Enugu. I am from Ibadan. I have yeah. seen uh, Eshef, Eshef is in Zambia. You know, and we have different people coming in from different parts of the country. We need to do a comparative analysis of the situation on the ground to understand it. It's also an avenue for us to locate hotspots requiring urgent attention. Um, mm -hmm. What are the areas that we may not be paying attention to in our site, and which is something that is, you know, a burning issue on your end. These are reasons why we need to have this conversation. Four, I think that the uh, Cody grads can support one another in pushing for impactful and gender sensitive policies and programs. So that is another reason why we need to have this conversation. And lastly, I want to say that intersections in our sectors can provide peer support and mentorship. And so uh, we have people of um, different classes, different ages, in different sectors, yet Cody has brought us together. And so we need to see how we can uh, leverage on that relationship, that networking, to see if we need peer support, if we need mentoring support, uh, you know, as the case may be. So that is one, I mean, those are the reasons why I believe that this conversation is very important. But permit me to move, uh, I just wanted to, I want to present um, what is on ground. Uh, so that when we start the conversation, when it, when it becomes open, we don't have to go back to, you know, what I have said. So we may just take note of uh, the areas of, I mean, areas that you want to point attention to or ask, and then uh, maybe there are certain areas that I omitted. I just want to move from, to just do a brief background of the situation on ground to vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 in Nigeria. And we know that um, the first case was recorded on the 27th February. Uh, 2020 in Nigeria, and it was an Italian citizen who works in Nigeria, and that report kept coming around, even though we've been hearing about um, the pandemic, you know, from China, and uh, the first um, case that was recorded was of that Italian uh, citizen that came to Nigeria, and uh, currently this is the 23rd week of monitoring the pandemic, and um, as at two days ago, that's on the 31st of May, 2020, there were 63,882 samples tested. 
there were 10,162 confirmed cases. There were 3,007 discharged um, cases, cases have been discharged, and we have 287 confirmed fatalities. Now that's being broken down by gender. Uh, we saw that um, we, we have 6,882 males, making 68% of the population that is affected. And then we have 3,280 females, making 32% of um, women, I mean, 32 percent of the total population of people affected. Most of the people affected are within the ages of 31 and 40. But something caught me, uh, caught my attention, and I'm surprised that um, uh, the I, I read those data from the uh, NCDC, the Nigerian um, um, Center for Disease Control, and um, one thing that caught my surprise was the fact that those within that data that had travel is history were just 223. That's just 2%, you know, of the people who have been recorded to be captured within um, the pandemic in Nigeria. Those who had contacts with other people, you know, uh, they're just 2,407, that's 24%. And those that they cannot tell where they got, I mean, where they got, they contacted is unknown exposure is 7,532, and that is very funny to me because um, the, the impression we got was that um, majority of the people who will get, I mean, who will contact the virus would have been people who had contact with people traveling out of the country, this and that, but there were funny enough, 7,000, over 7,000, whose cases, you know, they cannot trace the origin. States with high rates of infection, we have Lagos, we have Kano, we have um, the Federal Capital Territory, that's Abuja, and then Katsina. And of course, the state has been under close watch due to its proximity to Lagos State. Lagos State is the commercial hub of Nigeria. And um, so what has been done, government has placed um, levels of lockdown, particularly in the states that were most, uh, mostly affected. We had um, um, uh, we had a complete lockdown, total lockdown in some of the states. Uh, some of the states. Um, we have Lagos, we have Abuja, you know, and uh, we had um, Ogun State. And until recently, they started having, you know, days when they can go out and days when they can, uh, they have to stay back at home just to be able to, con I mean, to curtail the spread of the virus. And uh, we've also had um, partial lockdowns across um, the other states. Uh, for instance, in your state where I am based, uh, we've had a partial lockdown. Some people are, are permitted, especially those who are doing um, jobs that you know that require um, um, uh, special attention. Uh, people in the medical um, sector, people in the security, journalists, they've been permitted to move around freely. But the others, we've had to stay indoors. And our stay indoor has not been a complete, you know, lockdown like um, that we've had in our neighboring states of the state. And um, well, we've had that from time to time. We've had um, speeches from the president, uh, like some two weeks interval. They, they look at the situation, they assess the situation, and then give another two weeks. And it has been on and on like that until yesterday, when um, the, the federal government. Uh, started easing off the lockdown. And um, as at yesterday evening, we got a report that uh, the religious organizations can begin to open up for their meetings, which I think uh, is a good one. But when you consider that population of those who have been uh, infected with the total population of Nigeria, that is really, really um, not so significant. Of course, we cannot say that uh, the death rate, we cannot say the infection rate is not significant, but when you look at it vis-a-vis -vis the population of Nigeria, you see that we've been able to, uh, to manage the situation. And um, there are so many things that have happened in the middle of that. Uh, how has it affected communities? I will just go straight and then just give a general um, lowdown. I will expect that our colleagues will also say things, how it affected their various communities. But I noticed that we started out with the denial you know, the denial of COVID-19 in Nigeria. People were coming up with insinuations that um, the virus cannot survive in hot regions of Africa. Uh, they said things like maybe it's a disease for the rich people. 
um, said things like um, there are certain things that you can do to prevent or protect yourself from contacting the virus. And we moved on from that. People called it all kinds of names, flu. We call it flu. Some say it's just, it's just malaria. And that led us into uh, the trial of different kinds of drugs, you know, chloroquine. People talked about uh, the use of pepper soup, you know, different kinds of things, just trying to find solution to it. And in the midst of that, a lot of people were misinformed. And um, in the north, particularly in Kano, the, the, the reports, the medical reports kept coming in about increased uh, incidences of pneumonia, you know, until they were able to agree that COVID-19 was actually on ground in that place. And then we went on to the level of poor communication from government to the masses. The government did not sufficiently tell us what, who, why, you know, where, how, you know, all those questions were not fully answered to the understanding of an average Nigerian. A lot of people had questions, why do we have the virus here? How can we take care of ourselves? But not so much at the, at the onset was said to the populace about all of these things. We just had that we needed to go on lockdown. We were wondering what, why we had to do that. And it was just like a dream. Like, you mean the streets were going to get empty? But of course, eventually that happened. And we moved on to the eruption of prices between government and health workers. The health workers began to ask for protection. They began to ask for, you know, their allowances to be paid, you know, and things like that. The provision of facilities, they began to question those things, you know, the hazard allowance, the uh, test kits, the availability of isolation centers. And then we moved past that into the situation where citizens had limited health care. People were scared to go to get into the hospitals, even when they are sick with other ailments. You know, people who had diabetes, people who had cancer, people who had maybe the pregnant women, people were scared to get into the hospitals because they felt it has become a COVID center and they didn't want to contact the virus. So we moved on from there and then we had trivial assessment of how the pandemic affects other sectors. You know, people were not paying attention to, in fact, governments did not quickly pay attention to how this was going to affect other sectors. The educational sector schools are shut down currently. Um, the religious um, institutions are shut down. Uh, the organization, the private, you know, to, to start laying off their staff, you know, as a result of uh, the, the sudden, you know, um, incidents of having to, to go on lockdown, you know, and then it affected the economic situ and the situation of the country. And then we had lack of empathy for the masses. Several things were not considered before imposing the lockdown on, on, the, on the other sanctions. Several things were not considered. We didn't have sufficient data to know who and who needed what, and uh, you know, a lot of things were not in place. And so I feel that uh, the empathy that government should have had before deciding what to do you know, was not there. And then we had politicization of the pandemic. You know, we started having uh, the feeling and impression that um, maybe government was politicizing it and then trying to call attention of uh, international bodies for support and uh, for funding as the case may be. The larger Nigerian populace have been concerned with deaths from hunger, among other economic crises, than possible deaths from the pandemic. So you hear people say on the TV when they are interviewed, I hope that uh, hunger will not kill us before the virus reaches us. You know, when you hear things like that, a lot of them were really worried about how they were going to fare. And then existing challenges also aggravated the problem. For example, girl child education had been an issue, especially in the northern part of the country, because of uh, the insurgencies and uh, the civil unrest, the religious crisis. Schools were, you know, were not stable even before COVID-19. And now that everybody will have to go on, I mean, everybody had to go on lockdown. The schools were locked. And as we speak, we're not even sure that the number of girls who were in school before the closure due to the pandemic will be able to return to school. That is one of the things that has, you know, escalated the problem. There are speculations that many girls won't return to school. There are also speculations that um, uh, population control will, will be out of place because um, a lot of women may possibly get pregnant 
uh, during uh, this period. And then economic uncertainty, as I said, the employers are downsizing, salaries and allowances are not paid. Some companies, some organizations are paying half of the salary. We have reported cases of expatriates or companies, foreign companies, forcing employees to work under unhealthy conditions. You know, they just lock them into the factory and make them work because they do not want them to move out, you know, uh, uh, due to the lockdown and they must keep producing. So we had instances like that. And we had cases, for instance, in Oyo State, where from within the factory, several cases of um, uh, the, the virus was recorded. And then we have entrenched, I'm, I'm, ground, I'm rounding up now so that we can open it up. We have entrenched feminization of poverty. Uh, bodies of childcare fell the more on women. Women have been strained because now they are at home. Uh, some of them have lost their means of livelihood. They are now having to be the teachers. So, so schools kept sending the school, I mean, the classwork to the to the parents, you know, and then the parents will have to be the lesson teacher and the class teacher and the mother and the, you know, having to take care of several things at the same time, you know, providing emotional and spiritual spiritual support for the children. Then we have violence against women and the girl child. A lot has been recorded on that. Men battering their wives. Uh, rape all over the place, juvenile uh, crisis from, from place to place, and these are heightened as a result of uh, the uh, pandemic and, of course, the measure uh, taken by the government in terms of the lockdown. Lack of gender length in policy. We limited women's representation in government. Uh, we've not been able to see too much of uh, how this affects men differently from women. What we saw from the NCDC data just told us that um, less, lesser women are affected by COVID-19 in terms of uh, being infected and that more men are affected. But despite that, we've not been able to see more than that. You know, we should have been able to see more than that. Why is it that we have more men, less women? And in what areas of COVID-19 affected women, if not in the health you know, um, uh, aspect? So with all of this, I hope I have not left anything out. I know that my colleagues will have taken notes. And this is um, just um, a lockdown of the known. And I hope that we are going to be moving from this known to the unknown from our different uh, sectors and from our different regions. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That's a comprehensive overview of, of, the, of the serious challenges that we are seeing as a result of the pandemic, which has actually exacerbated so many other conditions that have been uh, that have already been in place, uh, and particularly when we think about um, uh, the impact of, on gender and, as you say, the feminization of not just the pandemic, but poverty writ large in Nigeria. So we open it up to the floor. Um, Dr. Sharon has provided some, some, uh, some, some strong oversights there, but, you know, you're all coming from different parts of the country. I'm wondering if you're seeing anything particular um, that you would want to highlight um, um, that build on what Sharon has said, um, and that might be unique to the, the, the places where you're coming from. And I encourage you, if I, in case I don't see a hand up with the camera, if you do want to use the hand signal that's in the chat function uh, or the participant list function, that's great. Otherwise, uh, if I don't see any volunteers, I'll be picking upon you to to actually come come forward and and uh, and to share your thoughts. Um, so, um, who would like to start? Is there somebody that has a hand up that would like to begin? If not, I'm going to go to Joy because I see Joy's hand up there. I'm going to unmute you, Joy. Go ahead, Joy. Yeah, yeah. No, my colleague has said a lot concerning Nigeria, but the aspect I want to rest more is on safety. You know, security are people who are supposed to take care and see that everything that uh, the NCDC has told us to do to avoid the spread of this uh, COVID, they are not helping out. At times, they are just there, people are crossing and they're allowing them to cross. So these things are transferring from one place to the other. But if they are serious with checking and ensuring that nobody crosses to the other state, they, it will be reduced. And also, the people who suffered a lot in this area is the artisans and the government workers because the offices are closed. And the artisans, they cannot 
speed except they go out to do something a day and come back. Even though it has been a, a somehow relaxed, but not totally relaxed, and it's causing a lot of problems. Also, in the education side, only the, those in the private schools are beneficial. They are doing uh, online uh, lessons. They are using Zoom to teach their children, so they are not lacking behind that at all. But those who are in the state schools are suffering because nobody is teaching them. And I don't know what happened because all of them are going to take the same exam, maybe a final exam, and they cannot cope up. So it will not mean that some will take their final exam this year, some will not take until when everything is over. And I, I believe that the school system will not be the same thing again. Because since the schools now started using uh, a Zoom or online uh, lesson and uh, exam and the rest of them, this will actually make others to be behind each other. The curriculum will no more run together. So that's the effect of this uh, pandemic. And also, it has been seen that so many states benefited from the, the relief the governments are giving. But so many, like in Enugu, I, I didn't know when people from NCDC visited Enugu to come and share whatever, or to go, come and give relief from the government. It's only the, the state government that is trying what he could do. I know he has been trying, Markets we are locked. Only one out of about five markets we are open, and you see people struggling in the market. So the, 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 uh, social distancing is no more applicable here. So this has caused a lot of problems. So, and I don't know. God has just helped us in this side that the, the, the pandemic is not noticeable as such as it used to be in Lagos, Abuja, Ogun, and the rest of them, and it has become. In fact, if, if people are going to be tested, I believe many will have it here, but because nothing is tested yet as ought to. So I cannot actually say that it's not here in Enugu as it is. We have, have not recorded over up to 30 in Enugu, but that may not be real if people will come down and do that. You know, in my own area, you know, we are building, because in the area I'm covering, children, they don't go to school. So we decided, the, the Center for Humanity now decided to put up a school building for them to stay. And when this COVID lockdown came up, I have not gone there for over three months now. I don't know what is their fate because they are no more going to school. They are not there. The parents, they don't even care about paying the school fees. We are the one that bring the children to the school. We pay the teachers. We provide their text and all those things, ensuring that these students have at least basic education. And all these things have now caused all, uh, sorry, a, a step back somehow that we cannot continue until things come to normalcy again. On the part of the women I am coordinating, you know, some of them are crying that they can no more go out to do something that will help them earn their living and to train their children. As my sister has already said, that women are suffering more in this area. And because of that, they can no more do it. Then IDP camps, people are dying there every day because the government are not helping out. They are not sending them relief as they ought to. Even the ones sending, some of them are not reaching them. So I don't know how somebody can just help out in this kind of thing, to ensuring that things are done in the right way. It has become a rape. My sister has said almost everything concerning us in this country. And I just want to stress on that security who are supposed to be the people who are going to ensure these things are done the way they are done, but they are not helping us. Rather, they, they, they collect money and allow people to pass, and you see the things spreading from one state to the other. The relief they have made yesterday it isn't involved in state traveling. Some people who have business outside this way and no more go there, and the business are collapsing. So many people have been relieved from their work. The, the people who own the industry say they can no more pay them. So a lot of this is causing a lot of havoc, and the people are good, going to go into hunger. But I believe that God will help us so that this thing can end easily, so that people can know what else to do. And I thank God for for for, for Koji, because it has helped me to know what to do in every situation and know how to gather people, encourage them, guide them, so that they can know something to do to helping themselves out in a particular area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joy. And uh, I'd like to come back later on to you to talk a little bit about 
what you found, some of the strategies uh, that you learned, um, what, which ones have been most effective. But I'll come back to you in a minute. I'm going to turn now to Abby, Abby Dune, um, uh, who would like to uh, go next. Go ahead, Abby. Okay, thank you so much, Helen, um, Sharon, and Professor Joy. Uh, it's a really a great uh, privilege to be in your midst today, despite the whole tension we're having here. Um, you know, I feel like I should be talking as a gender activist at this time, but I'm in government, so I can't talk like an activist while I'm in government. I either speak on the role of government during this COVID-19. And I want to thank Cody, uh, Cody for the training they've you know, given me because it has really helped me while I'm in government to see things in gender perspective and how to promote community development while also developing women's empowerment in the same process. Because I think this is really missing. You know, getting to government, realize so many things are going wrong that shouldn't be. But you know, it's an avenue for us to really make a change as a change agent. But, you know, COVID-19, not only has it, has it impacted on us economically and otherwise, but it has really shown how patriarchy is in our country and in our system. Everything in our structure is patriarchy, and it has also highlighted that. So what am I saying? The people that are the presenter tax force managing COVID-19 in Nigeria is majorly 90% men. So everything they are thinking how to address COVID-19 precautionary measures are in a patriarchy way. And, you know, 70% of people who are medical teams on the front line of our medical care are all women. So, you know, and, you know, there's nobody thinking about their safety, about their child care. When they go to, to work protecting, treating COVID-19 patients, they still go back home to do their child care role. Nobody's talking about how to relieve them. Nobody's talking about majorly the insurance that covers them. Yeah, they said the insurance is going on, but, you know, most of them said they are still finding it difficult to assess the health insurance for themselves and all that. So there are a lot of issues that we need also to highlight. Although you have women managing in FCT, where that's the federal capital in Nigeria, you have a woman managing the palliative distribution at the forefront. But coming down at the community level, I realized the structure we have set for, for palliative distribution is all about patriarchy. And what do I mean by that? We're saying at the community level, you should have community leader as part of the committee for palliative distribution. You should have the religious leader as part of the committee for palliative distribution. You have the ethnic leader as part of the committee for palliative distribution. All these people are all men, realizing everything. Which are, okay, we set up the structure managed by a woman at the forefront, but the structure that we really implement and distribute this palliative are all men. So where are the women leaders? So it just occurred to me that, oh, we have just set up a structure in a patriarchy way, not bringing into light the role of women. So we had issues with palliative distribution in FCT based on some of the structures we've set up for ourselves. And also the, the patriarchy in itself has also been identified in the kind of precautionary measures we have set for ourselves. So up to now, the federal government has not acknowledged the fact that social services essential services during COVID-19 lockdown. Social services are the kind of people to attend to gender-based violence, sexual assault, and all that. They were not considered as essential services because I'm sure they don't see it as an essential services. So at the first few weeks of the lockdown, we had increase in cases of violence against women. And the government is not has not even acknowledged as an essential service. So it was difficult for people who are social workers to move around, to rescue victims. So at that first week, I had to do something in my own office with other NGO and my partners to set up a call center. A call center to respond to cases of victims of sexual based violence or assault both men or women, boys and girls, so that they can have somewhere to reach out to. After setting up this call center, we realized that movement will be a challenge. So on my, in my own office, we decided to draft a pass that could enable NGOs that are working within the social services to move around to rescue victims and also get them the necessary care they need. 
after doing that, we also realized that, you know, we had issues at different levels of stakeholder or structures that we need to prosecute cases of victims of violence against women. Now the hospitals were closed and they were not attending to any cases that doesn't look like COVID-19. So we had to appeal and advocate to the states that to give the instruction to the hospital to make issues about violence a priority. Because, you know, you have to, when you have a case, I had a case of rape and it was very difficult even getting, getting the report of the rape case from the government hospital. They had reports about, they had issues about the care. So you have to pay for some of the services like rape, which I think is something after COVID-19 that we need to address as women's movement. Any victim shouldn't go to the hospital, have been victimized with rape and assault to go to the hospital and you'll be, you'll be asking them to pay for, for their medical treatment or their care or services. It's something I think we need to work towards as women's movement. So we had, we had issues about this, you know, the CMD of the medical hospital that was assessing for the rape case I was prosecuting said, because of the instruction they had from the minister, they, they were not able to attend to the, our request to get the medical report of the rape of the eight-year-old girl. So we had to, I had to personally go as a government official to him before he could release those medical reports. Things like this frustrates the prosecution cases of violence and it gives room for corruption. Now the perpetrator will have room to buy the police. The perpetrator will have room to appease the victim's parents who say drop the case and all that. It's, you know, when the cases like this are prolonged, it gives room for corruption. It, re it gives room for so many things to go wrong. And that's why you see a lot of people dropping uh, prosecution cases and all that because the victim said, okay, we are not going for it or they gave them maybe bribe or something. So we had to one-on-one, -on -one, as we face any challenge during this lockdown, we had to go appeal to the government agency, our sister agency who are superior uh, in the office than us to appeal to them on considering some of this. And also interstate movement. The federal capital territory is close to some other states and most people that are working within the federal capital territory stays in the neighboring state. So we had issues with victims and we can't transfer them to Abuja to assess care or services or prosecute case because it's an interstate travel and there's a ban on interstate travel. So we had to appeal with the tax force agency, security agency, manage this to also see some of these our services as essential, make it easier for us to transfer cases and prostitute cases. So a whole lot of things COVID-19 has really highlighted on patriarch in Nigeria to show mm -hmm. that our day-to-day -day activities in government and whatever levels of care is still patriarchy. So it's for us to think what ways are we looking at to limit this challenge and also raising more emphasis on the pandemic of violence against women in Nigeria due to some of this. Personally, I just realized that home is no longer a safe place for even women and children. So, so when we have cases of intimate partners violating their partners, it's something that like, okay, you are in the home together with somebody you call your husband, who you claim you love and all that. So why should they be abusing you like this? So if we didn't have a lockdown, we wouldn't have known that home is a critical institution that we need to look at when we are considering issues around right. violence against women and girls. So from the government perspective, we were in charge of palliative distribution and also sharing some relief material to people. As, as you know, the allocation from the government based on this COVID-19 has also reduced. So we pay, you know, we get most of our resources from Hoyt. As a local government, this month, our allocation for the federal government has reduced. We have public services to render to the people. We can't do that at this moment because the allocation, we are no more selling oil. The money coming from the federal government is reduced, and now we are not generating any IG, our internally generated revenue. It's has stopped because of COVID-19. People are not doing business mm -hmm. as usual, so we can't tax people at this time. So I even given people two, three months for them to come back to business and for us to be able to tax them. So as a government agency, it's really frustrating for us to really, you know, seeing how we can combat some of this challenge. And it has also shown us that, you know, we need to adopt ICT as our own ways of communicating and doing our work. Go Abby, ahead. Did, Abby, I'm going to just interrupt you for a second. Uh, there's oh. so much that you covered there that we need to unpack a little bit. You started off 
with you know talking about you know at the at the very top of your converse, uh, your your intervention about the fact that the the task force itself has been set up in a way that is just you know uh, again uh, focused in on uh, very patriarchal structures and norms and you indicated in so many different examples how that trickles down in terms of gender um, discriminatory practices policies and what is happening to women um, and really has focused in on a very very big area of uh of the of with very specific examples around um the increase of violence against women which i think is quite um quite an important um piece here i just want to if i could um i want to come back to you in a little bit but i want to also um provide the opportunity for a few others that have their hand up, if that's okay, Abby? Would that, I'm, I would I'm like fine. To, sure, and I, I would like to um, ask um, Adiola if um, you could go uh, next with your intervention, and then following that, I saw another hand up, and I'll come back to that person. Um, Adiola? Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, uh, basically everybody has said a lot of things. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so everyone has said a lot and um, I really appreciate what they have said. So I would like to take it from the perspective of the government in terms of, you know, um, providing palliatives. Government has really done in a lot, but I just want to say that um, they are not doing they haven't done this the right way. They have provided palliatives for, for people, but uh, they haven't you know, engaged with the civil society to make this work. And so if I were to read the government in terms of you know, um, supporting the people, because what I see now is that poverty has been further entrenched. So if I were to read the government, I'll do, I will probably read them like 30% in terms of um, uh, provision of palliatives to families. Uh, let me also say that um, in terms of the medical um, uh, personnel, the NCDC, they've really done a lot. And I give kudos to the Lagos State Government, where I reside. And so they've, they've really done a lot. So I, for that, I would really give them like um, an 80% um, in terms of you know, the work done so far. But there's need for more testing. Uh, there's need for, I, I, I do not advocate for, 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 for a total lockdown of the economy because for, you, you can hear from what Abby said, you know, uh, people can't, you know, pay their taxes and all of that because they're not earning anything. So it's, it's really important for us to understand where we want to go. We shouldn't continue to copy what other countries are doing because take, for instance, this morning, uh, government has is locked down and they're going to be allowing churches and mosques and all of those people to open up. Why? I, have, I, I believe that it's because they have seen this happen in places like France, so they believe that they have to do that. But have you put those things that are needed in place? The answer is no. Government hasn't done enough in, in, in terms of that. Abby also talked about domestic violence. Yes, that is on the, uh, is really on the increase. Intimate partner uh, violence, young girls being raped here and there. I work in a foundation, and um, you know it's it's very sad. The things that we hear every day, the things that we have to deal with every day, the kind of support that we have to do, you know provide for young girls. Recently, we had to feed one one hundred and fifty families, and not just you know give them you know something minute. We had to provide essentials, and at the end of the day, you could hear you could see some of these families crying that they had not eaten for days. So where is the government palliatives? Where have they all gone to? It's, it's a big question that I need people like Abby who are in government to answer. I'm not in government. I work in civil society. And for me, government has not done enough. It, they haven't done enough. Um, um, okay. So, um, so um, sorry, just a second. Yeah, in terms of the distribution, again, Abby talks about uh, patriarchy. It, it, for me, it is, yeah, it is a big issue. But the big issue is also about the insecurity of the government and um, the, the insensitivity of the private sector who are supporting the government. 
in, in providing these palliatives. I'm not saying it's not a good idea to, to support government. Like yesterday, the Boa group donated about 15 ambulances and they gave um, 100 million. And I'm asking, where are all of these donations? Where are they going to? Are they going into private pockets? Because we cannot see them. So for me, it's a big question mark on the government. I'm not saying they haven't done, they haven't tried, but we need to start to rethink now. Nigerian institutions have been individualistic. Now we need to build institutions so that when things like this happen, we have a fallback. We have no fallback. Everybody is taking it a day as it, the day as it comes. They are doing things as they think they should do it today. Tomorrow there's another directive. Tomorrow they think of another another idea and they bring it, you know, forward. So, for me, we, we need to do better than this. Really, thank you. Thank you very much, Adiola. And I thought I saw another hand up. Was it Fumilayo that had her hand up? Um, did you want to go ahead, Fumilayo? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Fumi. I, I'm Hello. based in Abuja. Hello. So I, I, I think for me, for the COVID-19 pandemic, I think my, where I got surprised from or where I got impressed from, I just want to talk about the things I, the good that came out of it. And that's about community organization and people organizing in their own little groups to try and support those who they think they need, need that support at this time. So for me, we have a program running in Aquaibom that takes care of children. And the organizations we worked with said they were able to organize communities to have like a sort of food bank. So those who had a little bit of more gave to those who didn't really have. And that was able to give that support, even though we didn't have grants to provide that support to them. And even in my school group i was surprised that my university group which i haven't even been a member of in the last 10 years had organized into an online group had raised money internally to give people who were members and who were um alumni who needed money and at this critical time to feed so despite the non-performance of government and some private sector partners, I see that individuals are looking out for each other and are looking at a way of self-organizing to help those within their communities. There's a lot of examples of people who are not um, an organized sector, individuals having a kitchen on the streets, feeding people. And there are examples of communities who are now having like a collation center to collate food, raw, raw food, you know, that's for those who really don't have in the community to give. And I think to me that's what I have seen happen in the last few days, which was surprisingly. Then talking of um, gender-based violence, like I think Adiola has spoken, um, it's, it's been, there's been a rise and I support some civil organizations in on gender-based violence, and especially for that against girls, what they've been able to do was try and see how they can program and try and see how they can use um, WhatsApp platforms and calling centers like the other person mentioned to be able to provide services. And to I have to give kudos to NATIC, the Nigerian Agency Against Trafficking of Persons. The, the organization I work with, we've had that their support. They were able to provide safe homes for girls who experience violence at this time. So that's all I really want to contribute. Thank you so much, Shafumi. And I see Sueze has her hand up. You want to go ahead, please? Go ahead. I've, I've now unmuted you, so go ahead. Oh, no, you're not unmuted. Sure. There you go. I'm go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So I will be talking mostly on healthcare and CDC and other activities of the Nigerian government. And first and foremost, when this became an outbreak in Nigeria, 
the entire Abuja city, the FCT, had just two working ventilators. An entire city of how many thousands of people, just two ventilators working. So our healthcare is practically non-existent. And this is why our leaders are always going outside the country to seek for medical care. And Nigeria, as everyone knows, is a country that is very rich and wealthy. We are supposed to have basically everything we need. But you go to even the state house clinic, you hardly find a Panadol or PCM. The president's daughter raised an alarm about that some time ago before this outbreak. So they keep on taking our wealth, giving to foreign countries, seeking for medical intervention for sicknesses that can be cured here. And within this time of um, two months, they have been ill. They have not gone for their medical checkup, but nobody has died from their pre-existing problems. So I think foreign countries should discourage our leaders from going and seeking healthcare in other countries because they take our wealth out and give it to them. So this has shown us that we are one entire village. And in a village, somebody has to look out for the other brother and another brother should look out for the other one. So foreign countries, the Western countries especially, and few Asian countries should help Nigeria invest in her country, especially in healthcare. This is so bad that medical practitioners did not even have PPE. And family members to these medical practitioners, some patients, friends, have contracted COVID-19 from these frontliners because they didn't have PPE to protect themselves from this when they were treating patients. And when it started initially, some medical practitioners were chasing away people that had symptoms related to COVID-19. They were scared because they lack PPE and what to do about this. Cases like pneumonia, asthma, bronchitis, that you have difficulty in breathing, they will automatically label you as prone to COVID-19 and they will turn you away without attending to you. And then when they were now given an education about this, they were now overlooking other sick people because they lack enough mass strength to take care of both the pandemic and the existing diseases. And people in the ID, IDP camps, they have been exposed completely to this and they are suffering a lot. I am from Benue State. We have pre-existing problem of the Fulani militants. So we have many IDP camps in my state that we have been taking care of. The state government, federal government assistance is not enough. So we individuals have been going to these places and even orphanages and other places to help them to make way for them to feel a lot better. And personally, we can't do this now. And these people have all come into the street to beg because no one goes there to see them again. And it's not our fault. I received a call from two orphanages and the maximum prison center in my place that it's a long time they saw me. As young and as I am just crawling with my little businesses, I had to spend my personal savings to give to people that came to my house seeking for food. And I knew they were not taking on due advantage of me. They were very, very sick. They were hungry. I needed to do something. And the federal government concentrated the help of palliatives in FCT, Oyo, and Lagos. That these were places that foreigners brought in COVID-19 and the rest of us, nobody knows where we got it from. So we should take care of ourselves. And that has been not helping us a lot at all. And in this time of lockdown, we have not been going to work. And still, the federal government have been taking taxes from us. We may cause the deduct taxes. We use data, they deduct taxes. We send SMS, they deduct taxes. And we have been locked down, not going to work, no palliatives, and they're still taking taxes from us. What do they mean? It is very unfortunate. And this is where I stand. We are particularly down and out. We have not been gotten enough help. And if our country is able to know where it stands, redirecting our resources to what is needed and not taking it out for medical and other tourists 
and other unnecessary, taking a big entrance to go to attend the international society meetings, this will help us a lot. I won't talk about our insincerity because that is homework. I'm talking about what others or this organization, Cody, can help us cater. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Some excellent interventions given by you and everybody actually that's spoken already. Sharon, I'd like to turn back to you um, in terms of what you what you've been hearing um, uh, by um, yeah, by colleagues um, in terms of both challenges as well as some um, places where they where communities have sort of risen up and and uh, and really come together. Um, I'm seeing um, quite a lot of discussion here about um, responsibilities that we have to each other, brothers and sisters, and the way that communities have risen up to to make sure that nobody gets left behind. On the other hand, the, the, the problems are so profound um, and there is an expectation that the state, that all levels of government will be, um, will be playing a stronger role in both assuring that the right, the, the adequate supports and the right resources are available, but also ensuring that, um, that economically, um, you know, families are, are, um, uh, are, uh, are given some, in, uh, some breaks in terms of the ways in which they, they can recover and actually uh, get through the, the pandemic in, in light of what Suezi was saying, which was, you know, we don't have anything right now. We don't have the resources and the means. And so, you know, how can we possibly be contributing more to taxes than we already are? So what are your thoughts? What are you hearing from uh, the conversation? And then I'll flip back to the, to the group. Okay. I would say that um, our colleagues have actually expressed them, their minds. They have shared their experiences from different parts of the country, from Benue, from Enugu, from Abuja, from Lagos, and these are really uh, interesting, like I will use the word interesting. Um, let me start with um, uh, Ben, who was talking about the vulnerable, the internally displaced persons. That it has been a problem in the hands of Nigeria for a while. And I knew that it was going to aggravate you know, with the lockdown. Um, and that leads me to uh, issues that have to also deal with the physically challenged. We are, we are talking about uh, the people, you know, who citizens generally, but there are people that have special needs and they have not been, nobody has been able to attend to them specifically. That is also very worrisome. Uh, we have um, uh, another issue at hand, the issue of the Amajiris in the north. You know, children who walk around, who go on Islamic education, and they've been all over the place. That has not been controlled. And uh, we've been having unregulated migration from different parts of the state, you know, and all of these things are contributing more or less to the crisis on ground. Now, the, the, the number of those who are living with, I mean, living below poverty line is also increasing because people are losing their sources of livelihood. And all of these things uh, tell that uh, the government, well, no, none of the government across the world has been duly prepared for this. Yes, we agree. But it shows, you know, the level of unpreparedness that the Nigerian government has had in this. Although we cannot say that they have not tried. Yes, they've tried their best. Unfortunately, that best is not good enough. There is still so much to be done. Somebody talked about the palliatives and how they are being distributed. I don't know what they are doing with the palliatives because virtually all of us, the, the civil society organizations, the individuals, churches, must have had to reinforce the palliatives. For me, I am aware personally in my own organization and the religious groups I belong to, we have had palliatives more than four times for families who keep calling you and keep bothering you that they have not eaten. And they have children, everybody is locked within the house. Some even have youths who have been to the universities. They have needs, you know, and all of these things. So there's so much that the government have not been able to do. And uh, well, we cannot continue to lament about what government, government has not done. Unfortunately, we, have, we know of some governments that have provided, you know, some more robust palliative for their, you know, for their, for their citizens. But since we don't have that, what then do we do? I think that, that's where we should begin to move at. Yeah, thankfully, we will see that it looks like 
uh, the, the rate of infection is, is, is beginning to lower. As of yesterday, there was, there was, at least in the last 24 hours, they said there is a zero uh, record, record of, uh, record of um, death. You know, and then the infection rate, maybe the state's reducing, whatever it is. But as they are opening up the system, we also need to know that we have to protect ourselves. Uh, let us not uh, take advantage and say that, oh, this thing is gone and it's gone forever. After all, we, we've had to deal with Ebola, with, uh, you know, and, and the rest of that, and they keep coming back and forth. So we cannot keep our eyes open. But what do we then do? I think that's where the conversation should lead now. What are we doing? We've heard from our colleagues what they have been able to do in terms of palliative, in terms of you know talking to people, reaching out, and all of that. So, what is the next thing that we need to do? I mean, you know, as a group, individuals. I think that's the direction this conversation should go now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Sharon. I think, um, especially now as we're starting to see things open up, and of course, what's happening in Nigeria is is similar to what's happening in our own country in Canada. Um, we are just starting to open up, but the big challenge right now is, you know, how do we ensure that we don't go into a second wave? How do we, uh, how do we sustain and improve on the healthcare sector? And, you know, we are very, very fortunate in Canada to have, I think, a very robust healthcare sector as compared to what I'm hearing um, today on this call about the, the, the lack of healthcare um, services and supports that are meaningful, especially given the population size. Um, of the country. So what is it that we do? And, you know, there's also been, I think, stories of, of a very positive change that has happened. We, we're, we have a tendency to focus on, on the negative because, of course, this is having such a profound impact on everybody. But there's also been, I think, amongst you, stories of, of, of innovation and change that's been happening. And those are practices, those, those kinds of changes may be practices that we also want to retain, that we say, okay, we, you know, the, the pandemic has created a, a spotlight on things that are, that are broken that need to be fixed. Now let's move forward to figure out how that can happen. So as you're thinking about those next steps, as Dr. Sharon has suggested, um, please you know, in, you know, share a little bit about where you think you and your organization might be going in that direction. And I see Dr. Adesope's hand up, so I'm gonna start with with the Dr. Adesope, if you want to go ahead, please. Good day, Ho. Greetings from Nigeria. Hello. Um, hello. Go ahead. Good day. Hello, can you hear me? Greetings from Nigeria. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, go Are ahead. We can, hear, okay. we can hear you. Yeah. I want to talk about my problems first before I talk about the solutions later. The problems I'm discovering with this lockdown is that with no job, no school, no trade, and most of the girls being kept in the neighborhood, there's a lot of un unwanted pregnancies and um, antisocial behaviors going on with the poverty level among most of them, they are getting engaged in what they don't normally get engaged with. So I have this problem on the ground now, which I'm still thinking, we are still thinking of how to deal with it. Because many of them are asking for help to do abortion. Many are having problems at home. There is the problem of rape in the land. There's the problem of uh, parents being hungry because of lack of how to take care of their children. There are so many things coming up that um, the, my NGO is finding difficult to cope with at this time. Over, that's all I want to say. Over. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to Abby. Um, if, uh, if you want to um, make your intervention, Abby, go ahead. Okay, hello. Okay, yeah, go ahead. sorry. Yeah, I'm at work. I have to do some other administrative work. So for us as the government is to see how we can make out some economic recovery plan 
So we already have a post-COVID-19 economic recovery committee in place as a government to assess some of the issues that we have post-COVID-19, how it's impacting on people generally, and how we as a government can make proper uh, measures, can put proper measures in place to address issues of economics. So we're looking at whatever the committee brings up on board as an advice for us to governments. As a local government, we are also looking at other opportunities the federal government will be bringing in and how our businesses or business owners within our constituency will be able to apply for those uh, relief measures for businesses. So the government is releasing a whole lot of loan application for businesses to thrive and also gathering data about the damages the businesses are occurring due to post COVID-19 and how the government can really put proper measures in place to address that. So we are also working with our business partners to make that possible for businesses around within our municipal. Like I said earlier on, we are also looking at relieving businesses from taxes for the next one month or two post COVID-19 so that businesses can recover while they're doing uh, trying to get their feet on the ground after post COVID-19. So it's also to also make our institution a little bit stronger and using ICT and digital tech, right, really to strengthen some of our administrative work so that people can also get informed about what we do as government and also get get our responses concerning any issues that we are facing. So we are using ICT to really drive some of our interventions that we're having in the next couple of months so that we can engage most of our citizens more and better. And also we are engaging in data collection on registering vulnerable families. So we realized during the COVID-19, we didn't have enough data about the vulnerable people within our constituency. So we are using this moment to gather data and register people who are vulnerable. But due to COVID-19, a whole lot of people became more vulnerable. So we have people like Uber driver who has been driving now out of jobs suddenly. So it now fall within the vulnerable people class. So we had issues with what are we going to use to classify the vulnerable and the less vulnerable. But COVID-19 has really shown us to us that a lot of people are more vulnerable and a lot of jobs are not really pandemic secure in the sense that, you know, most of these things that we're looking at is affecting most of our measures has affected a whole lot of economy and people are really finding it difficult to really strive. And as it's affecting the economy, it's also affecting the way of life of people and it's also affecting the social gathering or social development of people. So families have been forced to undergo a lot of stress and it has really raised a whole lot of tension within families and within the loved ones. So we're trying our best to really look at some of the issues that has been happening during COVID-19 and put proper policies in place and gender sensitive policy in place so that issues like this will have a proper measures in place to address issues. So we are working on policies to address issues post COVID-19 and other measures that are gender sensitive that will help our members of constituency to really strive better and really get back to their feet post COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abby. And I, I, I think that, um, you know, what you said about um, the numbers of people that are now falling into that category of vulnerable, you know, that vulnerable data category is, is quite, um, quite important, especially, we, you know, we speak a lot about uh, services to businesses, but there's the whole, um, uh, a whole grouping of informal workers, which are always, which are predominantly also women that, uh, fall outside of, you know, usual kinds of um, support mechanisms like like the ones that government has, uh, has Yeah, that's why we're trying to assess the federal government um, loans or relief material for businesses, especially right. informal for workers, so that we can structure them into cooperative to be able to assess those loans. So we're right. working towards that. Great, yeah, thank you. Swin Malayo, you had your hand up. I see you in the corner there. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, 
I thank you for giving me this over. I was looking for the uh, 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 the high count, but I couldn't find it. So <laughs> I had to go that way then. Eventually, I did. Thank you, you very much now. for this. Ah, all has been said. Yeah, the, these are of our uh, experiences that we are hope. I'm mean, from Oyo State, uh, and uh, I stay in Ibadan. And uh, then this pandemic, everything that has been said about this pandemic, uh, these are things that are known. And so I, I will not waste our time. I will go right to the uh, some of the interventions that we really need to pay attention to. Talking about gender-based violence now, which is very crucial at this time, it comes in diverse forms. You find it being done in physical form, and even in some health sector because of the initial news that, okay, a pregnant woman how to travel, a health worker, but a pregnant woman had to travel from one state to another, and then she uh, contacted the virus before traveling, and then she got uh, infected, and then she spread it over you know, to the health workers. And then we noticed that in that state, from that moment on, the level of uh, mortality within these two months that has been recorded concerning pregnant women who actually wants to give birth in the hospital and they have to go through the test at first because the nurses we now then, or the doctor now, we put them through uh, the test phase. And that had led to increase in the uh, mortality rate when it comes to, you know, childbirth mortality rate now. And that has greatly affected women. But uh, I think that is for government. But there is one crucial area I want to talk about, which is our whole mentality. We can't mention it patriarchy. Patriarchy tried because to a larger extent, women considered it to it. And how? This has been done through religion and some of our cultural dogma you find out that women consider to eat through the beliefs, and this has further exposed some of our children to incest and molestation in domestic sphere. And the level of capturing this is our own intervention as researchers. We've been trying to interrogate this, though we are faced with challenges. We cannot go out. We have to rely on some of our colleagues who are civil society workers, and then to get information from them in order for us to now, you know, get in contact with people who are directly affected by this, because these are sacrosanct issues, issues that are not discussed. And I'm sure Dr. Motosho uh, has been working with some of these children, and so she may have, you know, experience with how you find out that parents are even the first molesters, in some cases, in many cases. So the data has not been captured. The statistics is yet unknown. We don't even know the gravity of what has happened or what has been happening then, being aggravated by the by pandemic. It is after we have been able to capture the, uh, uh, the data, the statistics, okay, how many women are affected? How many men has been affected? Because now we tend to focus more on women, whereas the games are changing. Because men too have been molested. Our young boys have been molested. And we are all pretending as if we don't even know because they are not women. So we have to be hoping more about this. So as researchers, what we've been trying to do is to capture the experiences of men and that of women during this pandemic. Because I, an already vulnerable individual who now had to stay at home with uh, 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 an abuser or someone who is originally violent or someone who, who, who has the tendency you know, to be triggered by minor issues. We now have to face more of these things due to the lockdown because you cannot go out. And so I, I, someone mentioned uh, the, the usefulness of technology in all of this because we now basically at least 85% of Nigeria population have mobile phones on them. So I think we should now start looking for a way to create a security code which will be focusing more on gender-based violence in all its form, psychologically, physically, uh, 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 domestically, and whatever, even in the workplace now. Because this pandemic has taught us that we were not fully prepared. And it could it have been something worse than this? I mean, gender bias, gender disparity will have, you know, become much more evident. So that is my little bit. I think our whole mentality too 
is, is, is really hit because it all started like a joke. On social media, you find out that when the federal government announced the lockdown, people started talking about, oh, now you have to stay at home with your wives. And then the wives are happy. My husband will be staying at home with me. And then it, it started like that until after about two weeks. Then it became obvious that the staying at home wasn't that uh, going to be fun anyway. And then we started hearing, you know, increases. And then you found out that some men even had to go out. You know, they, they went out at the detriment of their own health, all out, claiming that they cannot stay at home with women. And like Prof has said, women now had to face the uh, load of taking care of their children, being the teachers, cooking, and at the same time, trying to manage the mood of a, a husband who would think, okay, it's too much for them to stay at home with their spouses. So I think our mentality as women also has to change because this has been there and it's just been aggravated by this pandemic. So that is my own uh, little contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a very, those are very important contributions that you've made. And you know, they make me think a little bit also about um, the massive amount of work that we'll have to go into thinking about trauma um, as we're coming out of the pandemic and trauma um, that will be, you know, that can be, um, that, that can be, um, you know, for the, for the best of us in the best of circumstances, there's going to be an impact of the, of the pandemic upon us, um, and especially as it's, as, as it's moved on. But those that, as you say, um, we don't even know, we don't even, we don't really understand yet even the, the gravity of the situation, as you've put it. Um, there, there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of work in that area. So thank you for that. So George, um, you have your hand up, so I'm turning over to you. Please go ahead. Sorry, George, I, I muted you again by accident. Could you please unmute yourself again? Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess, I, am I the only male in this platform right now? <laughs> All right, thank you very much for having me. Um, I consult for the UN and I'm from Nigeria, though I'm not currently resident in Nigeria. Um, I work currently here in Afghanistan, but uh, the world is a global village and I've been following up all the issues back home just to make a little contribution, especially uh, on some of the issues uh, Abiodun has raised. Um, for me, um, going forward, I have seen that there are a lot of opportunities that um, COVID-19 has also presented to everyone. Um, for me, one, I would say, um, the COVID-19, most, most of the palliative or the programs that were actually designed were designed targeting people who live in urban areas. Um, I went through most of the you know, radio announcement, even the palliative that were distributed, many, if not almost 100%, were distributed uh, you know, uh, in urban areas. You know? So my question was, what happens to those rural areas that are hard to reach, uh, maybe because of issues of conflict, you can't even get to those places. So, so many people have been excluded from whatever palliative, and many are also not in the know of some of the you know, government and programs that are actually ongoing. So for me, I would say uh, one thing that came out very clear from what other people have contributed is the fact that um, Nigeria as a country, we were not prepared, one. Everybody seemed to blame the government. Oh, government didn't do this, government didn't do that. But if you come to look at it, the government cannot do everything. I was expecting one. I had expected to see a better coordination among civil society. I didn't see any movement. I didn't see anything that, without the internet where civil society came together as a block saying government we know you are going to respond but these are critical areas we would want you to give attention to issues of women i didn't see that kind of mobilization 
where civil society groups, their voices were heard saying, look, there are women who are going to face this, or there are women who are going to be excluded. There are women who have certain issues. We all need to put all this into consideration. I heard what Abiodun said, the groups that were, that were put up uh, you know, to manage COVID-19, majority were men. Yes, you will see that happen because civil society are supposed to be the voices of people in the community. When they don't talk, government will do what they think is best. Also, I look through most of the, I come, I, I, I come from Enugu State. Uh, that's where I, I, I reside before I left Nigeria. There is no government uh, uh, intervention where I saw civil society actually taking a lead and saying, government, we think this is the direction you need to go. So we didn't have that kind of coordination. We didn't have that kind of partnership building where civil society government sits down and say, okay, you know what? This is what is facing us right now. You guys work with the, the, you are the non-governmental organizations. You work at the community level. We are designing a plan, whether it be palliative plan, whether it be a prevention plan for, for community members. What do you think? I didn't see that really happen. What I saw was more of the political class, government ministries, you know, sitting down and deciding and thinking, oh, whatever we come up with, we think this is going to be good. But right now we're saying that many people were excluded and so many issues were left out. Again, what I also see is that we've not been able to build partnership. Partnership in the sense that the government and the non-governmental organizations, there was no linking point. That's one. Uh, Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development in a country that is many of these issues of gender-based uh, violence, intimate partner violence, and all those things are handled by the Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development. My question would be, what was the input of civil society to whatever plan they had in, for COVID, for COVID response? So for me, I didn't see the, the, the building of partnership, the coordination among civil society. I'm, I'm taking government out of it right now. Coordination among civil society groups. I know in Nigeria we have this big umbrella NGO body that we have in Nigeria. Even at the state level, we still have umbrella organizations where many civil society organizations are registered. What was the role of this group? I didn't see that you know, play out in many of the situations. Building community resilience, it was a completely as absent uh, you know, um, idea from most of the plans that were developed. Community, as long as people continue to see community as, oh, they must be at the receiving end. The community has nothing to offer until you bring things for the community. The community cannot help themselves, which I completely disagree, especially at the rural community level. Without government palliative, they've been surviving. They have a way community have also built around themselves how to survive. How much did NGOs or government tap into that kind of resource? that exists in the community. Everybody became suddenly handicapped. One, two weeks of lockdown, everybody became hungry. Why? Because we were not prepared. There was nothing talking about community, community preparedness. I didn't see NGOs work with communities to say, look, this lockdown must have this kind of effect. These are the things we need to do. How did we garner the community to say, look, you are going to face a tough situation coming ahead of you. You have resources. This is not the time to waste your resources. This is the time to do this. This is the time to do that. So we were not seeing, I was not seeing a situation where community were actually harnessing, you know, uh, uh, community resources to solve their own problems. Rather, everybody folded their hands. We're waiting. Oh, the government didn't bring palliative. Oh, we're dying here. Even those who had things to do in their farms, even in rural communities, the government, some states said they would not, they would not allow vehicles move. But they still had provision for vehicles that we bring in food items. How much of these did we support community to do? So I just see that, you know, uh, in all, we shouldn't just transfer all the blames to government. Government cannot solve everything. I see that the civil society groups had a responsibility of helping government coordinate, helping government build partnership, helping government even strengthen capacity. How many civil society organizations even have the capacity to support government in developing an emergency plan. Because what happened to us, I'll say, it's an emergency you need to develop a plan for. How many people have that capacity to actually say, look, 
this lockdown, we were seeing what was happening in Europe. We saw what happened in China. So how many of us could actually, did have that capacity to provide that guidance and say, look, it states you have to have an emergency preparedness plan. There is going to be a lockdown. This lockdown might take more than a month. What is the arrangement for people to have food? What is the arrangement for people who face violence at home? Now we're using uh, innovative technology, mobile phones and all. Mm. How do we protect people, women and children? Mm. Those things were not factored in. And so that's what brought us to where we are. So I think that you know, we need to strengthen capacity, build partnership, coordination, and the civil societies need to be in the forefront in actually helping community build uh, resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. I think that there, it, it is a good question about um, um, umbrella groups that have been formed and the ways in which they've been able to coordinate um, you know, either responses or inputs to policy and, and decision making. It's also a big challenge, I think, if, if, you're, if, if uh, organizations in civil society in Nigeria are anything like what we've been seeing, uh, what Cody's been seeing in terms of uh, global responses, it's, um, you know, civil society organizations are, are scrambling, massively scrambling to, to, re, to, uh, to reinvent their programming, to, to rethink how they're going to operate, to try to uh, deal with the, with, you know, emergency supports. Um, with having to deal with the funders um, and, you know, hopefully funders are, are, are engaged and responsive. So there's a lot of other challenges that do factor into that. So I'm going to turn to Sharon, um, who um, I, I, I'd love to hear her, her thoughts on what she's been hearing. And then I'll turn to Rhoda after that. And then I think what we'll do, Sharon, is try to wrap up after that, if that's okay. Sharon, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, George. That was um, a big one. But I must say that um, this whole thing came as a road shock. Everybody was unprepared. Um, and then we got to a point, because I belong to um, the Association of um, uh, the Southwest um, uh, Civil Society Organizations. And then we got to a point where we started thinking, oh no, government won't do that. No, they, don't, they won't lock us down. You know, because we understood the way um, our communities run. But virtually, aside those who work within the government um, organization, most people rely on what they do on daily basis. So they make money on daily basis. So it was unthinkable that there was going to be that kind of shutdown and they won't allow people to go out. But in the midst of that too, we found out that civil society organizations then had to re-strategize and what they did was not necessarily, of course, they tried to engage with government, but not necessarily to now face government because government itself was all over the place. They couldn't decide what exactly to do. It was taking so long. And so what most civil societies did was to look back at their communities. Okay, so what can I do in my little space? And that were organizations that were interested in um, care for the widows, they went back to the widows to attend to them. For those who had issues with, I mean, who, who were focusing on internally displaced people, they just went back. But you can also hear one of the members here say that she has not been able to visit the camp, the IDP camp, because of the lockdown. So these are challenges that, you know, uh, really uh, slowed down whatever um, united forces that uh, the civil societies will have put together. And aside that, I want to say that uh, we cannot totally say that um, COVID didn't have positive impact. The COVID-19, of course, had, has its own positive impact, one of which is the fact that we are now beginning to see the need to cooperate. We are beginning to see the importance of partnership. You know, of course, we understood that earlier on, but now it is becoming an urgent task, you know, and that is one of the reasons why I believe that this conversation is holding. Of course, we also notice that uh, aside from, the, you know, those benefits, we, we notice that there's a renewed emphasis on personal hygiene, you know. Sanitation is becoming a thing that everybody now pay attention to. So that is also um, another area that I think, well, we cannot blame government, we cannot blame the civil societies, but we are all in this together. And so we can look at, we can also look at the strengths and see the way forward from here. Fine, the civil societies have not done so well, 
uh, maybe the government have not done too well, but at the same time, we are all in this together, and that's why this conversation is holding. So, we to fight common enemy. So, and that is what is on ground now with the civil society groups, which of course I am going to talk about later when we begin to talk about community engagement, you know, and the kinds of things we should do. Or maybe I should just go ahead and say that right away, that as we are doing community engagement, we have to be careful. And um, being careful within the context of not leaving the switched off communities alone, not leaving anybody behind. Now we are tempted to have our conversations and um, we are tempted to go virtual. Everybody was worried about, so how do we engage? How do we move on? You know, and that was a problem until people began to discover, oh, we can do this online. Most Nigerian communities used to be really conservative with the internet. You know, nobody wanted to try anything new. They say Zoom, they say which one is Zoom, they say Google this, they say which one is that, and nobody wanted to try anything. But we were all forced to settle down and learn these things. Aside the, the few of us who are in the academia and who have been using Zoom three or five years ago, not too many people started until during the pandemic. So, but we have to be careful how we engage, such that we do not now make everything virtual and leave the grassroots out of the intervention. It's very, very important. And then uh, we need to also know that we need to engage their local platforms. The radio, the TV, they are still very much on those platforms. So some of them may not be on WhatsApp, they may not be on Facebook, but they still listen to radio. And that is one area where we can also carry them along and then uh, make for, you know, uh, uh, movement, you know, to see the desired change that we are looking for. And we also need to begin to engage until something happens. So I agree with you that the civil society groups should have been able to be a united force that will approach the government to say, this is the plan. But I wonder if there was ever a plan, if anybody ever envisaged that there was going to be a lockdown in a place like Nigeria, where the social security system is not as adequate as we find in other clients. So that is also there. And of course, we also need to begin to look at intra-feminist uh, cooperation. We need to begin to look at that. How do we cooperate? We are talking about women not uh, having a voice. We are talking about the prevalence of patriarchy. We are talking about uh, the problems of uh, violence all over the place. But where are the women? How do we support each other? You know, what kind of uh, uh, relationships do we have? You know, if we're going to begin to have more boys within those systems, the civil society, the government, you know, the media, all of that, we need to build it together. If I find my sister who is going out there, uh, contesting for whatever office, I should be willing to support, so long as that person has the integrity and the credibility to be in that office. So these are things that we also need to begin to consider. And of course, I think I should say this also, that this conversation should also bring us to a point where we can support each other pro bono consulting. We are all Cody graduates. Let's begin to look at situations where we actually need a particular consultant in a particular area and we don't have the funds for it. You know, we should begin to look at what we can do to support each other. Or not taking advantage of each other, right? But of course, trying to see how we can support within our various communities. That is very important. Thank you. Great interventions, Sharon. I'm, I'm also seeing in the chat box that there's been some great commentary. Um, Adiola at the beginning had said also uh, in response to George that, you know, there is such a distrust between civil society and government and uh, on, on both sides. And this is part of the reason um, that it's been challenging to mobilize. But uh, she's also noted that civil society has done a lot to provide palliatives to many families um, and continue to do so. So there's they're operating, I think, with the with the resources that they have and to the best of their ability. Um, you know, uh, some positive impacts as well. So as I mentioned that, uh, you know, as a result of COVID, we've been exposed to the fact that we can cut costs. We can be looking more at efficiencies and and still looking at levels of service that are that are quality. Um, Fubin Malayo said that rural communities need a lot of grassroots engagement. To your point, Sharon, of you know, not just thinking that this this you know that we're not creating a digital divide, if you will, not assuming that everybody can just pick up and 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 figure out ways of communicating um, along online, but that grassroots need to also uh, be be thought through, and not everybody's at the same place. 
um, a focus on livelihood support programs was also mentioned. Um, and Swayze has also mentioned around the hygiene consciousness, as you've pointed out, Sharon, that it's improved a lot and uh, we need to continue to do that. Um, she's mentioned the work that she's done with her church. Rhoda, I'm going to turn to you now um, and uh, if you want to offer some thoughts from your from your perspective and the perspective of your organization. And then we're, because we're at four, already uh, almost to the hour, second hour ending, I'm going to uh, suggest that Sharon and I wrap this up. So Rhoda, go, to, go ahead, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, Eileen. I'm sorry I came in late. Um, I was on another call that lasted an hour. I'm so sorry. Um, so I'll keep it short. Um, a lot of well, we're, we've been talking about how COVID has been affecting our organizations and our, the communities that we work with. And I think this is a general feeling across the different communities, no matter where you are in Nigeria, whether you're in South or the East or the West or the North. Um, granted, the degree at which um, people are responding to the pandemic varies depending on one, the, um, the position before the, co um, before the pandemic hit and the resources that they actually have available within the community before the lockdown started. Um, for us as an organization, I work with HACI. Um, HACI is a development organization that works with women and young people primarily on issues relating to the sustainable development goals. And our work generally is focused on helping women um, uh, achieve a health, healthy and productive life. So you can imagine what it would look like when we can no longer go to our communities, when our women can no longer um, visit health centers because um, the health centers are now focused on preventing COVID or there are fears that there would be infection if the women come and they cannot actually afford to go because transportation has locked down. And because there is now no transportation, it increases the cost of available transportation, and there is no money to actually afford those transportation, and they are stuck at home. So what we have done is just within those communities. I think one of the things I had learned during COVID, was, uh, during my time at Coding, was to actually um, use the resources of the communities to actually build the community. So what we have been doing over time was to build the community itself to actually respond to its challenges. So we had been building the um, strength and the capacities of um, the traditional birth attendants to support um, public health care services within the community. And we'll be strengthening that relationship between the TBAs or the CBAs with the primary health care center. So while most communities had that complete breakdown of services, some of our communities could actually still get um, maternal health care services through the TBAs who were within the communities and uh, were a phone call away, basically. So that actually helped them to an extent. Granted, we also have been doing a lot of palliative and relief material distribution, including hygiene packs, especially now that it is more important to make sure that um, maternal health care and um, child delivery takes, care, takes place in a hygienic um, environment. So we've been doing a lot of that. So we, we've done it in over 10 communities now and reaching a lot of women. So we've been doing that as well to help the communities actually get back on their feet and encouraging the community members to actually support themselves because we cannot go into the communities. I think uh, a lot of us have had that situation. Um, Sharon has shared that, Fumila has shared that, the, we ourselves as nonprofits find it difficult to actually move around for ourselves, let alone moving to um, render services to our target um, beneficiaries. So it's difficult for us as humans, it's difficult for us as an organization, but we can work, so we are working with the communities to um, support themselves and help us support them in the end. Um, I also want to say, I agree partially with what George has said, about um, nonprofits or NGOs coming together to actually um, have a plan on what we are looking at when it comes to COVID pandemic. And it's not just about the pandemic now, it's about after the pandemic because 
it might look like it's taking forever, but the pandemic will end. And what happens when the pandemic does end? Um, I think Dr. Essiet had talked about the plans that the government was having for the COVID economic recovery, the COVID economic recovery plan. And we need plans like this. Do we have plans when it comes to sexual reproductive health for young people? Do we have plans when it comes to maternal health? Do we have plans when it comes to youth employment? So these are things that we need to start working with the government. With. We, a lot of organizations do not have history of working with the government or, or the government listening to them in the first place. So we need to use this opportunity to actually bridge that gap. Most governments do not know what they are doing right now. It's not just Nigeria. Nigeria is not alone in the cluelessness of the COVID situation. So it's everywhere. A lot of people do not know how to. So we need to put our heads together to work it out. Um, Haiti as an organization is just part of different coalitions, both in Lagos State, where we are based, and in other states across Southwest Nigeria, of um, nonprofits that are coming together to see how we can actually support governments to actually make better plans that include the voices of one civil society, um, non-profits and the communities that they will be working with and they will be serving. So I think we should stop looking at it from the negative perspective of what the government is not doing right to how we can use both our resources to actually make lives better and easier for our people. Because at the end of the day, we are serving one population. We are serving the Nigerian people. And that should be our focus, not the government is not doing well. Civil society is not cooperating with each other. We don't have enough funding. I don't think there's enough funding in the world to solve the number of problems that we have. So we just have to keep on making the most of what we have currently. Um, another thing that um, we've been doing is uh, we've been using this opportunity where young people are at home to actually engage them in creating and implementing solutions. Uh, they are less distracted by daily living, basically. They are, they are not going to school. They are not um, uh, engrossed in the hustle and bustle of trying to make a living. So right now, they are at home. They have, we have that opportunity to actually get their attention and push them in the direction where they can actually contribute to solving the situation. Um, as an organization... Um, we've set up different groups online, different WhatsApp groups and online platforms that young people can come together and talk about issues and participate in different solutions. And I think that's what more organizations should start doing. Engage these young people in activities. Once they are engaged in positive activities, they'll have less time to be engaged in negative activities. Nobody wants to be thinking about school right now. There is already so much stress, both emotional and mental, that nobody's, a lot of organizations are not looking at, especially the mental aspects of it. And it's, this time is when we should start engaging young people in things like volunteerism, in um, going out to communities, ensuring that they have the right kind of information, that when um, we've, we've gone through this phase, they're actually better off than when, they, when we started or uh, before the pandemic began. So I think this is where we should start focusing our energies on building a stronger um, human resource, on building stronger organizations that can actually help the country move forward post COVID. And we need to start that now. We need to start building the plans now so that by the time we are through this rough phase, we have something to start off with after um, once the pandemic. Thank you so much, Rhoda. Those are um, some excellent suggestions that really build on um, other thoughts that have been made um, amongst the uh, members on the on the call today. And I've seen some more excellent comments um, being put into the chat um, in terms of uh, you know the challenges around education, the lack of affordability, the challenges in particular again of using um, internet uh, as a re you know to rely on in terms of advancing education. Um, then there's been some uh, some additions by Adiola around um, what um, their organization is her organization is doing um, to support women or women and youth um, 
where they've got uh, a, a range of learning uh, possibilities for them uh, and also how they're providing at the same time uh, uh, food as well you know so basic basic needs in addition to life skill building um, so you know I'll come back to um, some of the things that were were said at the end and particularly back to my uh, my co-facilitator Sharon who who really did put out a call there um, for us to be thinking collectively, all of you to be thinking collectively as Cody graduates, how you can advance the discussions, how you could advance the work, um, and how also you can come together as graduates where it makes sense to do so and where there's a willingness to do so, um, to offer that kind of support to each other um, in whatever form that takes and to share, to continue to share the learning that is uh, that that takes place in you know in a very small way. This webinar is an example, but it it could lead to to more uh, more conversations. So I invite you um, to to share with us. Um, um, you know you can use our women lead at saintfx.ca email address to share additional thoughts that you might have having done the done the webinar, but also to indicate whether you would be interested and willing to. To sort of put your name forward to be to share amongst this group, um, you know your information so that we can build the network. Um, Cody doesn't share your information automatically. That's uh, we we respect the privacy and confidentiality. But if there's enough of you that want to get together and to and to regularly connect or to you know to share your details with other graduates, um, then let us know and we can make sure that we're putting that together. And as Sharon said, I would even take it a step further to say, we can even share bios if you wanna share a bio amongst each other about you know, what each of you are doing. So, um, so people know who they might be able to call on um, should there be um, an interest in doing so. Those are some, those are very minor suggestions that have nothing to do with the pandemic, but it just so happens that the pandemic has given us this opportunity to, as Rhoda said, go deeper in terms of thinking about how do we how do we look at you know look at the past, learn from what we what what's been done in the past, learn from the the mistakes that we're making all of us along the way in the pandemic, and figuring out a better world as we're moving forward. That's utilizing all those skills around community lead, leadership and participation. So I'll st I'm going to stop there and share it over to you for the final words on the webinar today. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for your time. This this for Nigeria is um, is a lot of commitment to to be online for this long, and uh, I want to appreciate that. Quickly, I will say that um, Rhoda, um, I agree with you that we need to look inward and see the kinds of things that we can do for ourselves instead of waiting on government. But at the same time, we should not complain too much about government and what government is not doing, and then overlook the fact that we need to continue to speak truth to power. We must not ignore that. We need also to know that we need to put our government on their toes, you know, from time to time to let them give account of the kinds of decisions they make. It is very important. And as we are doing that, we need to, COVID-19 is now putting on us, the owners, to begin to do our SWOT analysis of our government. What is it that our government, even in our, at our various state levels, you find out that some were strong in a particular place, they were weak in particular areas, you know, there are opportunities, there are threats. We need to begin to understand all of those things and begin to assess them. At the same time, we need to also be assessing our own, to be doing our own sort analysis at organizational level and at personal level to see how we are doing, you know, with regards to preparedness, with regards to uh, handling uh, urgent situations and things like that. And lastly, I will say that as much as we are, we are trying to make a change, as much as we are trying to make positive impact in our country, we also need more women in research and development. The more we get people involved in these things, it's easier for government to plan when they have the data that they are working with. That's one of the things that we are doing at the Women's Research and Documentation Center of the University of Ibado. We need women in science and tech. Of course, a lot of women are in the health sector, you know, but are they at the, at the top? Are they at the decision-making level, you know, that can affect us positively? That's important. Women in leadership and politics is also very important. So as we plan, let's begin to look at how we can change the face of government to put responsible, much more responsible leadership and of course, more committed women to ensure that we have gender parity. 
you know, within the government in Nigeria. And lastly, I would say that we need more women in philanthropy. If we had more women, you know, in philanthropy, probably they would have focused more on the community than giving the money to the government. I don't know what that scenario would have been, but I think that more women will need to get into that aspect, no matter how small. You know, let's begin. Of course, you will say that I zero that smiling, saying, How much do women have? We have some of the women who are really rich, and we have some who can afford to share the little they have. And so let's begin to look at all of that. I want to thank you immensely for joining us today. And uh, I believe, like Hailin has said, that we hope to take this conversation forward, uh, depending on our interests and uh, what we think we can achieve with this. Thank uh, a lot of thanks to Cody for bringing us together. I am meeting new friends. I have received private chats, and uh, I know that I am also going to link up with a number of people. Sometimes you get to some cities and you don't know who to come to. Now this is making it better. And uh, we want to thank Cody for, Cody for putting this together for us. And uh, that will be my parting shot for this afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody. And stay well and stay healthy. Special thanks to Kate for supporting today and for my other colleagues on the call today, Hannah, uh, Riley, and of course, Robin. Um, we have been really, uh, we've learned a lot today from all of you and we look forward to continuing these kinds of conversations. Don't hesitate to reach out to us and thank you again. Have a great evening tonight, everyone. Stay well. <laughs>